31 people in the call, and I thank you all very much for tuning in to um, this. Uh, I guess this is the second broadcast on the, um, the LBI network, so to speak. This is um, our, our second um, live online program. Um, and we're very delighted today to be with the uh, um, author, poet, um, uh, theater maker, Max Cholek from Germany. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, Max. Um, I'll just read a little bit about Max's background and then um, we're gonna see some of his work, uh, some of, um, I guess you would call it theater or, or, or media work. And, and then he's going to um, talk to us about um, his, uh, his ideas um, for 20 minutes and then we'll get into a discussion. So uh, uh, about Max, uh, Max lives in Berlin. He was born in 1987 and studied political science at the Technical University of Berlin and earned a doctorate um, at the Technical University Center for Research on Anti-Semitism, uh, which of course is a, a close partner of Leo Beck Institute. Um, uh, we have many interactions with the faculty there and, uh, and some overlap on our boards and, and uh, um, an academic advisory uh, working group in Germany. Um, so in, in that sense, Max is sort of uh, part of the LBI network. Um, and I believe, uh, Max, correct me if I'm wrong, but I leave, believe you were in the first group of uh, students whose studies were supported by the Ernst Ludwig Ehrlich uh, Studienwerk. More or less, yeah. yeah so um, uh, that's another, uh, a great uh, institution, one of the public scholarship funds uh, associated with um, religious institutions. Um, and uh, there's a Catholic one and there's a, uh, an evangelical one. And uh, there's a, um, uh, since relatively recently, um, a Jewish one uh, called uh, Ernst Ludwig Ehrlich Studienwerk. And um, that's another institution that we work uh, closely with. Um, Mute. But um, uh, since 2009, uh, Max has been a member of the Poetry Collective G13, and he uh, was a curator from 2013 to 2018 for the project Babelsprache International, um, which was uh, uh, to connect to a young German-speaking and European poetry scene. And together with um, Sasha Mariana Salzmann, he was the inter in initiator of Desintegration, um, a Congress of Contemporary Jewish Positions and the Radical Jewish Kulturtage in 2017 at the Maxim Gorky Theater in Berlin. Um, uh, he's published two books of poetry, uh, or three books, it looks like, Jubeljahre and Grenzwerte, uh, published by Verlagshaus Berlin. And in 2018, um, his nonfiction book, Desintegriert euch, uh, was published. And um, I think. That's gonna. Um, uh, it's a really fascinating book that uh, that I've been reading, and uh, it's the ideas from that book are some of the things that Max is going to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. But first, Max, why don't you introduce um, this uh, uh, this uh, sort of video work that you've done that I think was for uh, one of your projects at the Maxim Gorky Theater? Perfect, uh, David. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for joining. Uh, I mean, it's really like, it's not like I've done this a lot before to have 35 people in the room and not seeing any one of you really. But um, let me just try to maybe just start derailing right at the beginning and, and, and go a bit of a different path and just give you a few ideas on, on the, the framework in which the whole thing is set that you're about to see, then bring that as an example, as a sample for the work we have been doing and then continue from there. Um, because I think a lot of ideas um, that are conveyed in the, the video clips you're gonna see um, are only gonna be gonna be like perceivable, only gonna be interesting if you know the the very maybe very German background of 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 what of the work we have been doing. So let me give you a few ideas of the German background. I do not know, and I cannot really ask you if you know anything about the German context. So I'll I, I, I'm going to try to give you as much of an impression um, of what's going on there because I feel like it is very different from the American context. Um, and it is different from the American context, especially because of one very central word, 
um, which is the word integration, um, which has a very different meaning from how uh, it is being used in the States. In the States, integrated schools basically have a bit of a positive ring as far as I know, whereas the integration discourse or the integration paradigm in Germany is more or less the central terminology that has been used as like a, a controlling um, um, concept for migration. So if people are coming from the outside, uh, what they got to do is they got to adopt and they got to um, and behave differently. Uh, and they are under suspicion of not being democratic enough. And this whole set of ideas and suspicions uh, is being put under the umbrella of integration discourse. So what you do is you ask people to integrate um, and you ask them to basically assimilate. And that is very different from, um, let's say, a more uh, uh, American or Anglo-Saxon concept of, of diversity, which in Germany is really just beginning, um, not on the societal level. We already are a very diverse society, but on a conceptual political level. Um, so if you hear me speaking, you do kind of get an idea of, of, of the, let's say, scientific angle I'm coming from, which is sociology and political sciences, which I'd say is one of the three pillars of my work, is my um, our, like scientific um, education as a political scientist, mostly at Free University Berlin, as an old left, like known for its left-wing tradition. Frank Mecklenburg, who's also here in the room, is going to have something to say about that as well. So that is the one thing that, that I'm bringing to the table if we're talking about desintegration and, and the German Jewish theater of memory. I'm going to come to that in just a second. But also um, uh, the second thing is, um, and I think David mentioned that already, uh, is that I'm the first generation of, of young people who was able to be educated in Jewish institutions. Um, let me explain that. Uh, when I was like, when I went to Jewish school, which was in 1993, the school had just been founded. So um, before, it was impossible as a Jewish person to have a German education and at the same time have a Jewish education. Um, so, so that was really something new, and that continued. Like with me growing up, the Jewish institutions also build up. So in a way, me going through Jewish school and then doing my high school degree, only then the Jewish scholarship network was founded, actually two years after I entered university. So I became a part of that. So in a way, I was able to go through my whole career, my whole education career um, with uh, Jewish institutions on my side. Um, so that, I think, opens up a different space to define who you are and where you're coming from. Um, and that is different from a solely German-Jewish interaction. Uh, so now I'm coming to the second term, which is also very central to my work. And I didn't invent that. It's coming from Michal Bodemann, who's a sociologist. Um, and it is uh, the term Gedächtnistheater or theater of memory. And the theater of memory designates the interaction between the Jewish and the German side. Because the interaction between the Jewish and the German side after 1945 in East and West Germany is very peculiar or is very specific. And it, it's specific in a sense that for the German side, the presence of the Jew became more and more a like a symbol uh, for the democratization of the German society. So after 45, increasingly, the Jew became a function for a German idea of Wiedergutwerdung, of becoming good again. Um, knowing that, uh, that also means that the Jewish side is being put into a very specific spot within society and also within the public. So the Jew is supposed to perform very specific roles and very specific functions, right, uh, in, in Germany. And those functions, if I put labels on them, 
Uh, I've, been, I've been basically three topics, which is talking about anti-Semitism, talking about Holocaust, and talking about Israel. That's like the three topics that a, a, a public Jew is supposed to talk about. So if we now approaching the artistic work we did in Maxim Gorky Theater, we were trying to go against that. Um, um, and why were we going against that? Because Sasha, Mariana Salzmann, my partner, like my colleague and me, um, we kind of we kind of sat down and, and just talked about how sick we were of always being put in this one place or at the same time not being Jewish as our like only form of existence at all. We had all kinds of different things we brought to the table and me growing up in the GDR, um, coming from a communist family, uh, uh, growing up in Berlin um, um, and being, make, being a man uh, uh, and Sasha uh, bringing all, all of her story to the table as well. All those kinds of different things didn't matter once people knew we were Jewish. So in a way, what we tried to do is to find a way to deal with those projections, um, but not to find a way, because that'd be the easiest way, right? To just become invisible, to just say, look, we're not gonna talk about those things anymore, and then people are just gonna go away, but rather to, to, to accept that and to start playing this game. So in a way, what we thought was um, boiled down in a, a thing that Hannah Arendt, the famous, Jew, famous German Jewish philosopher once said, which was, if you attacked as a Jew, you got to defend yourself as a Jew. Um, so what, what we said was, okay, if you want to play this game, let's play this game. We're going to do one show, which is called the deintegration. And this deintegration Congress is gonna is gonna turn things around and say everybody is being invited to this show, even Germans. So that was a bit of a provocation because usually Germans are being used to being invited, and then you say even Jews or even migrants or even everybody else. So what we did, we turned this around. And for that, the last pillar I was I, I wanted to tell you before uh, we we show those uh, screen those uh, clips which the first one was political science, the second one was Jewish institutions. The third one is the theater we were doing this in, which is called Maxim Gorky Theater. And Maxim Gorky Theater is, um, has become very well known in the last 10 years as the central space for looking for a different aesthetic and political language for what they call a post-migrant society. Post-migrant society is basically trying to do something that I was telling you before, which is that the radical existing diversity of German society has not really been translated into political concept or aesthetic visions. So Maxim Gorky Theater really became something like a, 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 a focal point for those new um, impulses that came out of a different changing reality. Um, so the, the Gorky Theater in a way was predestined for us to do a work like deintegration because deintegration was based on getting away from a very like, established relationship, which is the relationship of the Jew that is always one to the German side. So what we tried to do was to get away from this German Jewish uniqueness or, or exceptionalism or, 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 or um, uh, uh, one way path and to rather open up to a post migrant diverse society to not only define our Jewish aesthetic practice, as a practice addressed to the German or refusing to address the German, which is simple dialectics still basically on the same line, right? So what we did for the, that the first one was, as I said, called the Integration Congress in 2016. And the clips you're about to see were taken from a, a event, an event called Radical Jewish Culture Days, which was the second event that took place in the end of 2017. And back then, I don't know how it was in the States, but in Germany, we had a new 
channel that had been uh, uh, put up. And it was uh, put up by the Russian state or mainly funded by the Russian state called Russia Today. Uh, I don't know if you know Russia Today, but Russia Today is like a fake news channel uh, in Germany. Uh, I'm sure like fake news was, was all the talk back then in 2017, probably also in the state. Um, and we decided to, to found a Jewish fake news channel. Why a Jewish fake news channel? Because what we felt was that uh, one, uh, fake news do have a bit of a, a, a well, contrafactual but utopian or dystopian core. I do know how the world is supposed to be, and this is why I want to see news that tell me the world is like that. So we felt like, well, like we have visions about how the world is supposed to be, so why not telling those, putting those visions into Jewish fake news and just tell a different story? Also, because we felt like, well, if Russia Today can do fake news, we can do that as well. I mean, we have been the, the wise of Zion all along. So why not kind of accepting the idea of, of, of an anti-Semitic inscription instead of always saying, no, 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 you're wrong. We, like we were, in a way, we were sick and tired of always saying, uh, no, 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 you were wrong. Um, um, we, we rather felt that, um, that people were not lacking information. And that's the thing about Jewish fake news. We didn't feel like we had to do another documentary channel just telling people how Jews really are because all the information people need are already right there. Um, so what we tried to do was kind of go against that and say, you are afraid of the Jews ruling the world because they are. And you're afraid of Jews taking over the country is because they are. So we felt like this was take, putting us into an aesthetic place uh, also by like an aesthetic strategy, which was had much more potential than trying to explain that the anti-Semitic stereotype, just for an example, was wrong. So we felt like, no, let's just go straight straight on and, and just, just play with that. So with those things, um, it's basically already half of what I, what I have to say before we start talking. I'd love to, to show you those clips, the Jews News Today, it's four clips. The first one was shown on October 3rd, which is the day of German unity, which is a obviously a notorious date for the idea of like ethnic Germanists coming together after in 1989. And we can talk about that later if you want, because this year we got 30 years of, of unification. Uh, the second one was uh, uh, released one and a half weeks later, then another one and a half weeks later. And the last one was released on November 9th. Uh, which I'm sure you know, and it's important because um, November 9th was also the day, as you're going to see in the clips, when we kind of unveiled our big master plan to, for a Jewish revolution to take over Germany. Um, you're going you're gonna to see all of that now. Uh, it, it has English subtitles. Um, for you who know German, um, I am lucky you because I think it's much funnier in German than it is with English subtitles. But anyway, um, happy you're here. And, and uh, let's see the Jews News Today clips now. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much, Max. Uh, Sophie, can you share the screen? Here we go. RJ, the most trusted Jews in news. Das war's von mir. Danke fürs Schauen. Ich gebe ab an meine Kollegin Rebecca Schlomka. Juice News Today beginnt jetzt. Liebe Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer, liebe Goyen, schön, dass Sie eingeschaltet haben bei Juice News Today. Zum Tag der Deutschen Einheit senden wir heute live vom Lokalsmann mal Berlin. Dort ist, wie wir hören, eine bemerkenswerte Entwicklung im Gange. Unsere Reporterin Rachel ist vor Ort und berichtet über den neuesten Stand der Dinge. Danke, Rebecca. Die Ereignisse haben sich in den letzten Stunden überschlagen. Schon seit einigen Tagen hat das Abgeordnetenhaus von Berlin über ein Bürgerbegehren diskutiert, welches einen Eintrittspreis für das Holocaust-Mahnmal forderte. Nachdem Bürgermeister Michael Müller die Entscheidung zu einer Gewissensfrage erklärt hatte, kam es innerhalb von wenigen Stunden zu einer Abstimmung. Die Auszählung der Stimmen findet in diesem Augenblick statt. Statt. Während die Stimmen ausgezählt werden, erzähl uns doch noch ein wenig von dem Entscheidungsprozess. 
Nun, Rebecca, im Vorfeld hatten engagierte Deutsche Unterschriften gesammelt, um das Bürgerbegehren im Abgeordnetenhaus einzubringen. Statt der benötigten 20.000 Stimmen kamen insgesamt 250.000 Stimmen zusammen. Rachel, kannst du uns mitteilen, was gerade bei euch passiert? Ich höre gerade, dass die Ergebnisse nun da sind. 152 der 160 Abgeordneten haben für das Gesetz gestimmt. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich euch das vermitteln kann, Rebecca, aber die Stimmung ist ekstatisch. Die Leute sind völlig aus dem Häuschen. Rabat Ljubavic hat zwei Lastwagen Wodka aufgestellt und nun ist hier Party, die voraussichtlich bis in die späten Abendstunden reichen wird. Was wird jetzt mit dem Geld passieren? Was wird der Eintritt kosten? Die Höhe des Eintrittspreises ist noch nicht geklärt, auch nicht die genaue Verteilung. Fest steht, dass das Geld für koschere Blutkonserven Anti-Nazi-Panzer und zur Subventionierung von Vanillepudding in Israel verwandt werden soll. Danke, Rachel, für die Informationen. Wir sind gespannt, wie es weitergeht. Liebe Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer, liebe Goyim, das waren die Jews News Today. Folgen Sie uns auf Instagram oder Facebook. Bis nächstes Mal wünschen wir Ihnen gute Tage. Träumt gut vom Jud. Das war's für uns. Danke fürs Schauen. Nun gebe ich ab an Rebecca Schlonke. Jews News Today beginnt jetzt. Liebe Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer, liebe Goye, bahnbrechende Nachrichten erreichen uns heute aus Frankfurt. Die Deutsche Bank hat sich offenbar als erster DAX-Konzern dazu verpflichtet, eine Judenquote einzuführen. Wie das Unternehmen heute mitteilte, soll im Vorstand, im Aufsichtsrat und sogar im mittleren Management der Anteil der jüdischen Mitglieder auf 30 Prozent erhöht werden. Was es mit dieser Entscheidung auf sich hat, dazu ist nun die Sprecherin der Deutschen Bank zugeschaltet, Siglinde Metzger. Shalom, Frau Metzger. Shalom, Frau Schlomka. Frau Metzger, in Ihrer Pressemitteilung heißt es, dass die Diversität in den Entscheidungspositionen vergrößert werden soll. Wieso? Die Erfahrungen, die wir in unserem Innovationsdepartment Social Design machen konnten, zeigen, divers läuft es einfach besser. Gemischte Führungsteams arbeiten effizienter und kreativer. Außerdem fordert die Politik ja schon seit Jahren ein Einlenken der Wirtschaft in der Quotenfrage. Als größtes deutsches Finanzhaus sind wir bei diesem Thema gern Vorbild. Die Quote galt in Wirtschaftskreisen bereits als umstritten, als es noch um höhere Frauenanteile in den Gremien ging. Wieso denkt Ihre Chefetage plötzlich anders, wenn es um Jüdinnen und Juden geht? Frau Schlonka, wir wollen zukünftig global eine größere Rolle spielen. Und um das zu erreichen, müssen wir uns personell fit für die Zukunft machen. Die Kompetenz jüdischer Mitbürger in Finanzfragen steht ja außer Frage. Die weltweite Vernetzung sowieso. Deshalb akzeptieren wir auch keine Bewerbungen von frischen Konvertiten und Konvertitinnen. Schließlich wollen wir ja wettbewerbsfähig bleiben. Die von Ihnen festgesetzte Judenquote liegt bei 30 Prozent. Dabei macht der Anteil jüdischer Menschen in Deutschland nicht einmal 0,2 Prozent der Gesamtbevölkerung aus. Interne Studien haben gezeigt, dass es eine kritische Masse von 30 Prozent braucht, damit eine Minderheit ihre Talente spürbar in das Unternehmen einbringen kann. Ein Alibi-Jude oder Alibi-Jüdin. Alleine bringt's nicht. Jetzt mal Tacheles, Frau Metzger. Kann es nicht sein, dass bei der Entscheidung auch Schuldgefühle eine Rolle gespielt haben? Oder der Versuch, listige Restitutionsansprüche endlich loszuwerden, die mit Beschlagnahmungen und Arisierungen jüdischer Vermögen durch ihre Bank im Dritten Reich zusammenhängen? Ganz im Gegenteil, Frau Schlomka. Unsere Entscheidung ist in die Zukunft gerichtet. Die Gräber, Gräben der Vergangenheit wollen wir zuschütten oder vielmehr überbrücken zum Nutzen aller. Ich finde, dass das ein Anlass zur Freude ist. Frau Metzger, vielen Dank für das Gespräch. Und wir, sehr verehrte Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer, liebe Goyim, sehen uns bei der nächsten Ausgabe von Jews News Today. Bis dahin, bleiben Sie koscher.
Das war's von mir. Danke fürs Schauen. Ich gebe ab an meine Kollegin Rebecca Schlompka. Juice News Today beginnt jetzt. Liebe Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer, liebe Goye. Über den Begriff der Leitkultur ist in den vergangenen Monaten wieder viel gestritten worden. Auffällig ist, dass nie über andere Leitkulturen als die deutsche gesprochen wird. Das heutige Interview wollen wir daher dem Thema der jüdisch-muslimischen Leitkultur widmen. Dazu begrüße ich Mohammed Jihad und Leila Goldzahn. Guten, Guten Tag. Tag. Guten Tag, schön hier zu sein. Shalom. Was genau verstehen Sie unter muslimischer Leitkultur, Herr Jihad? Also muslimische Leitkultur in Deutschland, das ist für mich der Muezzin in Köln, morgens zum Kaffee. Hupen der Autokorsos, Brust heraus, das Lamm auf dem Grill, Couscous-Salat und Taboulet. Sie kennen den Geruch nach Köfte und Döner. Das ist Deutschland. Und für Sie, Frau Goldzahn, was ist jüdische Leitkultur in Deutschland? Nun, Rebecca, lassen Sie mich eine Gegenfrage stellen. Kennen Sie ein Orchester ohne Geige und Klarinette? Oder kennen Sie einen deutschen Wald ohne Judenbuchen? Oder eine wolkenlose Nacht ohne Sterne? Vor einigen Wochen war ich an der Ostsee. Da gingen die Menschen nackt vom Strand zur Dusche. Das ist alles jüdische Leitkultur in Deutschland. Das würde es ohne uns und ohne die Deutschen nicht geben. Ist jüdische, muslimische Leitkultur dann also Döner unterm Sternenhimmel? Waldspaziergang mit Muezzin? Danke für die Nachfrage, Frau Schlomka. Das haben Sie ganz richtig erfasst. Die jüdisch-muslimische Leitkultur ist deutscher als die Schwarzwälder Kuckucksuhr, Currywurst oder Lapskraus. Sehen Sie, jüdisch-muslimische Leitkultur, das bedeutet für mich, Sonntag ist Samstag ist Freitag. Abend ist morgen. Paranoia ist Normalität. Es bedeutet guten Rap und ein paar zusätzliche Feiertage. Wer feiert denn heute noch Nikolaus? Wen interessiert denn der heilige Sonntag? Nun gut, der deutsche Innenminister wäre da anderer Meinung. Sein Motto lautet bekanntlicherweise, wir sind nicht Boka. Wir sind auch keine Bratpfannen und keine Bierflaschen. Man kann kein Gegenstand sein. Frau Schlamm. Gerade reicht uns eine Eilmeldung. Ein Stummtiff? Mit dem Namen Mendelssohn nähert sich mit rasender Geschwindigkeit. Dem deutschen Wetterdienst zufolge hat Mendelssohn derzeit die Stärke 11, könnte aber bis zu seinem Grenzübertritt die bislang erst einmalig erreichte Stärke biblisch erreichen. Behörden warnen davor, sich in der Nähe von Kirchen und AfD-Parteizentralen aufzuhalten. Da diese Expertinen zufolge besonders anfällig für die zu erwartenden Niederschläge sein sollen. In Ungarn und Österreich hat Mendelssohn bereits verheerende Schäden angerichtet. Neben riesigen Wassermassen führt der Sturm auch allerlei Kleinstgetier mit sich. So regnete es an einigen Orten Frösche und Heuchrecken. Die Regierungen von Kasachstan, Usbekistan, Turkmenistan und Iran haben Hilfslieferungen von Blut zugesagt. Bitte, schalten Sie Ihre Radio ein oder kommen Sie, wenn es Ihnen irgendwie möglich sein sollte, ab dem 2. November in das Maxim Gorki Theater. Dort erfahren Sie die aktuellen Informationen zur Entwicklung von Mendelssohn. I say it every day, Jews News Today starts now. Liebe Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer, liebe Goye, heute ist ein Freudentag. Anscheinend haben Jüdinnen und Juden das Maxim Gorki Theater Berlin übernommen. Wir sind exklusiv und live mit einem Team vor Ort. Hallo Raschel, was passiert da im Maxim Gorki Theater? Rebecca, so etwas habe ich noch nicht erlebt. Es scheint, als hat eine Gruppe jüdischer Revolutionäre, die sich die Radical Jews nennen, das Gorki Theater für Jahre unterwandert. Heute schlugen sie dann in einer konzentrierten und entschlossenen Aktion zu. Wie genau sind die Revolutionäre dabei vorgegangen? Klar ist, dass die RevolutionärInnen mit hoher Professionalität zu Werke gingen. Sie haben bereits heute früh die 
Webpage des Maxim Gorki Theaters judaisiert. Später folgten die sozialen Medien. Theaterbesucherinnen begrüßt ein neuer Name auf dem Hauptgebäude, genauso auf dem ehemaligen Studio Ja. Zurzeit ist es sehr schwierig, an gesicherte Informationen zu kommen. Rebecca, ich würde nicht von einem Akt der Vergeltung oder Erinnerung sprechen. Vielmehr scheint es sich hier um eine völlig neuartige Form der kulturellen Aneignung zu handeln. Die Juden haben mehrfach betont, dass ihnen die Taten der Deutschen völlig egal sind. Im Garten hängt ein Banner mit der Aufschrift, wir haben den Krieg gewonnen. Und wie geht es jetzt weiter? Die RevolutionärInnen haben sich eigenen Angaben nach vorgenommen, die kommenden vier Tage weiterhin die radikalen jüdischen Kulturtage fortzusetzen, welche bereits seit dem 2. November laufen. Wohin auch immer sie gehen werden. Sie werden keine Ruhe mehr finden. Wir sind das Konfetti auf euren Dachböden. Wir haben das kulturelle Kapital, wir haben die Wut. Eine ganze Armee von Toten steht hinter uns. Wir sind die Störgeräusche in euren Ohren. Jahrzehntelang haben wir uns in euren Theatern gelangweilt, um das hier zu ermöglichen. Heute das Gorki-Theater, morgen Berlin und dann das ganze Land. Egal in welchen Winkel der Republik ihr euch flüchtet, ihr werdet uns nicht entkommen. In diesem Moment indem ich das hier als Teil der RJK sage, aktivieren wir unsere Leute in den Redaktionen, übernehmen wir die Wasser- und Elektrizitätswerke und leiten die Finanzströme auf unsere Konten um. Wir sind zurück. Hello. Hi, uh, Max. Oh, cool. I take it your plot succeeded, and you um, you took over the theater, and everything goes your way in Germany now, right? Actually, actually, there's a funny story about that because we what we did was a few like we we talked to Gorky Theater PR. Um, so someone just joined just to tell you what you just saw was a few. Um, clips that we showed before and during the radical jewish culture days which was a an art event at a berlin theater called maxim gorky theater um uh, late 2017. um and what we did was we talked to maxim gorky theater the the like the, the people who do the website and and all of that and we asked them if for the 9th of november the thing you just saw in the end they'd be willing to change their facebook uh, uh profile and everything um, in a way that it looked like it had actually been um, occupied by Jews. So what we did was we changed, we photoshopped a few changes into the theater. So we had Maxim Gorky Theater and then Stars of David right and left. You saw that. Uh, and actually I met my mom the same day and she was like, let's walk by Gorky Theater. I was like, why? She's like, I want to see how it looks different now. So that actually was a big success for me because she felt like, like the thing that we had been doing for fun had actually uh, uh, happened. And then in the in the evening, we had a concert of Daniel Kahn, which you may know was a, a, a Yiddish new plasma singer who's very well known in Berlin. And we actually had someone coming, um, disturbing the concert because she wanted to, to tell us that our occupation wasn't a real occupation and we shouldn't make fun of occupations because occupations are something serious, something like that. So I guess if you do something like this and people are taking you serious, that is a very good thing. Um, let's, let's just give you a, a very like few ideas of the let's say aesthetic strategies or aesthetic political strategies that were behind those clips, um, because in a way there's as I see it two um, central points of reference which which we we try to kind of play by uh, 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 trying to get out of the theater of memory of the German-Jewish interaction. And the one was an, uh, uh, a reference to the real Jewish diversity that is existing in Germany today. So what you find in Germany today, um, there's 90%, over 90% of Jews coming from the Soviet Union. Um, so by any means, the the Jewish community in, in, in its majority in Germany um, wasn't freed from Auschwitz, they freed Auschwitz. It's, they were part of the armies that conquered Germany. 
So in a way, the German-Jewish interaction, as, as, as it has been going on ever since 1945, uh, isn't really working for the empirical group and their experiences, because the German-Jewish interaction would always be the German, uh, 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 let's say, the, the, the German saying, sorry, we tried to kill you, and the Jews saying, well, at least we survived. So by now, you have a bit of a different setup if you take this serious, because now the Jews won the war. So that'd be a different interaction all along, right? If you, if you let's just have the German side saying, um, sorry, we tried to kill you, and the Jewish side saying, well, in the end, we conquered you. That'd be a different story. And this was one story that we tried to, 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 um, to kind of to kind of put into our our narrative and into our our show. Um, at the Desintegrations Congress, we had uh, a DJ set by Yuri Gorgi, which was called "We Won the War." We have the Krieg won, um, which is just coming out now. And May eighth is going to be another day of celebration. So that is the one thing which is a a um, reference to real narratives to real biographical difference that is kind of shaking up this idea of the Jew always being the survivor, always being the forgiving side, always being uh, a friendly, more or less, and, and alive. Basically. That's basically all you got to do is to be alive. And on the other hand, um, what we also tried to do was to find fictional points of reference, which would help us to get away from this character of the good Jew that is being demanded in the German Jewish theater of memory. And for that, um, I was very interested in, in the, the theme of revenge, um, Jewish revenge in, 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 in especially, um, which probably the first point that, that, that happened to me was in Glorious Bastards, which probably you know. Um, but also I was wondering why there were so many like groups that had experienced discrimination which had evolved into some kind of radical branch, like Black Panthers, radical feminism, um, 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 things like that. And with Jews after 45, you didn't have the same thing. So I thought. So then I started doing research and I figured out that that hadn't become part of the official historiography, right? Not from the German side and also not from the Jewish side. So both sides had been interested in not telling the story of Jew Jewish revenge, which we can, I mean, we understand why that is, but from an artistic point of view, I'd say that is a, like what you say in, in German, ein gefundenes fressen, a found, a found meal. <laughs> That's something you got to go for, right? You got to, because it kind of helps you to get away from this idea of the good, innocent, uh, a Jew that doesn't have any negative feelings in his mind, but just survived the war, doing nothing wrong, all that kind of stuff. You know the story. Like everybody knows the story, and we try to get a, like to to go against that. Um, so revenge, in a way, helped us to also open up for a different space within a German public, a different discursive space, if you want so, from where a Jewish position could actually talk. So when before you only had the Jewish side talking about anti-Semitism, Shoah, and Israel, um, what we try to do with deintegration, and this is why it's called deintegration, because we try to get away from the setup that is being designed for the Jew, the Muslim, the migrant, the woman, uh, the lesbian, all that, and to, to try to get away from this and shake this up. So, so to get away from this idea of a well-ordered society where one group decides who belongs and who doesn't and and who is being demanded to 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 integrate and who is already a part of society uh, so in a way the integration is a bit of the bigger societal scheme behind that which is really combining the jewish german situation and the situation which i was i was um trying to tell you about before which is like the post migrant situation the theater of integration the idea that as a, a minority, especially as a migrant minority, you got to behave in a certain way to become German. But even if you if you are in Germany for the third generation, still you're going to be demanded to behave in a certain way. And the same demand is not being put on, for an example, German neo-Nazis. Why? Because they already belong. 
And that, at least from our perspective, is ridiculous. And we like we were kind to try to 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 go against that because, and this is the last thing I'm going to say now, and then I hope we kind of be able to, to enter a bit of a discussion. Um, because once you under like once we understood that the theater of memory puts a, a like a functional central position on the Jew as a symbolic figure in order to reinvent a German idea of goodness, normalcy, pride in German nation, because the pride in the German nation is only possible once you have kind of dealt with the past. If you don't deal with the past, there's always a suspicion the German who loves the nation is being a Nazi. So in a way, you got to have the Jews on your side. And only after this, after, after kind of appropriating the, the, the symbolic Jew, you can love Germany again. And this is actually what happened with the World Championship 2006. What you had is from the 80s on, you had a very intense shift in focus on the theater of memory, on remembering the Shoah. The Shoah became more and more central in like public German uh, memory discourse uh, about 1933 to 1945. And then at a certain point, um, uh, this, this, the like this memory work, Erinnerungskultur, this memory culture, kind of allowed for a non-right-wing German public to be proud about Germany again. And this, I think, is the, the, the central point that, that at least my critique and Desente is, is is focusing on, which is that the symbolic Jew is being used to renormalize German nationalistic feelings. And if that is true, if the if the symbolic Jew is helping the German side to not feel bad anymore, I felt like, from the Jewish side at least, we would have to really think about whether we'd actually want to perform this function. So in a way, when we said, go play your theater alone, like go do it on your own, like what we did was for the first uh, Congress, we, we gave the, the, the visitors um, kipot and we like kipot to build themselves made of paper. And we told them, look, look, like just take the kippah, just do it yourself because we don't want to be part of this game anymore. From a left Jewish perspective and, a, and a, like a critical perspective on nationalism, we just do not want to perform this task. And if this is what you're putting us into, we're going to be very clear and kind of trying to get away from that. Um, so to, to wrap this up, um, what we tried to do with the integration um, was to establish a different position, discourse position or public position for a Jewish person, which was not anymore only fulfilling the function defined by the German dominant side. But trying to get away from that and by and trying to get away from this because Jewish reality had changed in the last 30 years, because my own education, as I told you before, uh, my own education had allowed for me to be a different Jew than just to, to react to what the German outside was kind of trying to put on me. And third, to, to actually be able to find new ways to do art, uh, because a lot of art framed as Jewish art is extremely boring um, because it's it, it actually is kind of limited to those um, aesthetic cliches of, of the violin, the black and white picture, the, the suitcases, uh, uh, the flickering candlelight. I, I, I guess you know what I mean. Um, so we tried to kind of also open up for, for different fresh perspectives on that. Um, Right. So with that, let me, I'll just kind of leave it here. I've, I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. Um, maybe it's a good point to, to kind of have all of you ask questions for me to yeah. clarify, because I'm sure not everything is, is, is clear. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Max. That was really fascinating. And um, just a bit of housekeeping. We would like to hear from you. Um, and uh, so I just ask that if you'd like to um, ask a question, um, write to me in the chat and um, we'll, we'll turn your camera on um, and, uh, and 
and uh, well, you don't have to turn your camera on. Actually, we'll we'll unmute you, and then uh, you can uh, participate in the discussion. Um, and if you can't find the chat, it's down. Uh, if you just move your mouse, a, a black bar appears on the bottom of your screen, and you should see a little uh, like cartoon bubble that says chat below it. Uh, so that's where you find that. Um, but I, I think I'll kick things off um, with a with a question for you, Max, just to just to get things rolling. Um, and that's that. Um, so, well, I've been uh, reading your book, Desintegriert euch, and um, you know a few of the other things that uh, you've published lately. Like there was this article in the in Transit uh, on overcoming the present. Uh, uh, that's a journal out of Berkeley, and it's I I just want to comment that it's really fun to read because it's this kind of rhetorical, uh, uh, polemical style. Um, that, uh, it, but that sort of um, talks about all the things you read in German feuilletons, but is also, you know, conversant in hip hop and Tarantino, and and you know, as you mentioned. Um, but you know, one of the things that that's clear is that one of your methods is just this rhetorical inversion of concepts, like um, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I don't know if you were responding to it exactly, but there was a book by a German sociologist called Integriert euch, um, Annette Treibel, or Treibel um, with, a, with kind of a moderate message saying that integration is a two-way street, the, the Germans have to do it too. And of course, mm -hmm. your, the title of your book inverts that. Um, and it's the same thing with overcoming the uh, past. Um, and you say, no, overcoming the present. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, Another aspect is um, uh, that people, most people on the call may be aware of, but some may not, but um, the, part, the festival that you curated at the Maxim Gorky Theater was called the Radical Jewish Culture Days. But of course, many German cities, including Berlin, have Jewish Culture Days mm -hmm. that are um, you know, more closely associated with the organized Jewish religious communities there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I'm that was a long preamble to get to the question about um, um, you're not just inverting concepts from the dominant, you know, German Dominanzkultur. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's also, or, or perhaps the concepts do originally come from the culture, but there are also things um, about organized Jewish life in Germany um, that you're interrogating and inverting uh, and questioning. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what the reaction is, has been like to your work um, from within um, Jewish uh, circles mm -hmm. in Germany. Um, so you're certainly pointing out that it's much more diverse than most Germans realize, um, but it's also uh, not not necessarily the same as the um, self presentation of the sort of majority of Jews in in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. So can you can you talk to that? Mm -hmm. um well, thank you so much, David, for um, for that question. Um, let me start by what, like, just briefly addressing the the question about integriert euch, um, just to give you a general idea that ever since um, Hessel, a French writer, wrote this book, empört euch. What is empört? Can you can you translate that, um, David? Be outraged. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like that. Yeah. Be outraged. Um, um, you've had this this figure of like something euch mm -hmm. uh, repeating all along, like integriert euch, desintegriert euch, desinfiziert euch now with the uh, corona. Yeah. There's a lot of like like uh, plays with that as well. So um, that wasn't that genius, right? It desintegriert euch wasn't really not even my first my first um, uh, choice. That was my publishing house who tried oh, really? to like who chose this word this title. I wanted to call it No Jews for Germans anymore, keine Juden mehr für Deutsche which I know is less of a title, but I felt like uh, that'd, be, that'd be an appropriate way to say it, um, uh, which is a funny story because we, we raised some public money for, for the first, uh, first event and it had the title Desintegrationskongress, kein Juden mehr für Deutsch. And then they called us and said, uh, look, you got to change the subtitle because if you don't change the subtitle, the, 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 like, the Bundestag, basically, the House's representatives, is going to demand an explanation how the money we granted you is being used for the public good, which I found extremely funny because in a way we had already kind of hacked the system. Um, 
so but but besides that um if people are talking about integration there's a lot of confusion going on between a let's say more analytical approach which is which is asking for how is the how are people integrated by certain factors do they have work do they speak german do they know all that kind of stuff the second one is normative shouldn't integration be a concept that is counting for germans and non -Ger like and migrants alike that would be a normative concept that is trying to say, look, we can think about integration in a productive, meaningful way. And then there would be a more discourse analytical perspective, I guess, that is asking, how is the reality of the integration discourse? How is it being used? And if you look at how it's being used, it's not being used to ask Nazis to integrate, but it's being used to always label the same people as the others. And this is the third, the latter is the one that I had been focused, that I focused on and on which history I focus on, because there's a lot of history within German political thought that is feeding this idea of one dominant group, um, which is more like either ethnically or culturally or in German history, actually both uh, 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 marked as an ethnic cultural unity, Deutsche Kulturnation, which is basically kind of being kind of being continued in this idea of integration and also in the idea of light culture, which we haven't really, really talked about yet, but the idea of a hegemonic culture um, uh, is, is a second one. So that'd be, that'd be like the, the conceptual remarks I wanted to make about your question. And the second thing, um, which is more about the, the organized uh, Jewish communities. Um, well, I mean, on the one hand, you're right. Uh, I think there's a there's a second, uh, or maybe there's just a different um, generation, let's say, um, that has come up, which is not really during this old idea of multicultural art, which which used to be at least in Germany, um, um, it manifests in things like the carnival of cultures. You'll have every different culture in Berlin city doing a bit of samba. Doing a, bit of, uh, doing a bit of flamenco and doing a bit of clarinet and plasma. That'd be the idea of a carnival culture. I call that a 90s idea of, of how cultures are being portrayed for the, like in a way, in, in a way it's essentialistic, in a way it's exotic, and it's for everybody's fun to see how colorful, we bunt, how colorful Berlin is. Um, and I think like Jewish culture days, they come from those times. Um, so, so they still have this idea of dancing Havanagila and of, of flying some, some horrible <laughs> East, cheesy Israeli pop singer uh, whom, whom you probably wouldn't listen to if it wouldn't be for the Jewish culture days. And then you, you just have um, um, a very um, folkloristic um, um, idea of what Jewishness means. Um, a bit of Holocaust, a bit of Israel, a bit of, a bit of folklore from Eastern Europe, all that. Um, and we try to, we like, we just try to to move away from that by by not actually when we talk when we said radical Jewish culture days, we didn't actually try to talk about Jewishness in in this in this folkloristic manner of like what are our rituals and what is our art and that kind of stuff, but to ask for perspectives that were shaking up the way uh, uh, this Jewishness was usually presented. So what we did was we did work on, on, as I said, revenge, we did work on queerness and being Jewish. We did work on being a migrant and being Jewish, just the kind of combinations of different intersectionalities, which, which weren't usually put into the center of, of culture days. I'm not saying that culture days are devoid of anything interesting. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there as well. But just our approach was a different one, mm -hmm. like that. And now to the organized um, 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 religious Jewish uh, uh, structures, I'd say that with, you mentioned Ernst Ludwig Ehrlich Studienwerk, which is an academic scholarship network. And um, I think my experience in ELIS was one of the central reasons I even started working from that kind of perspective, because I suddenly found a Jewish um a group of jews that didn't define themselves primarily through like religion but through intellectual practice and that is a different artistic practice and that is a different thing and i had been looking for this and in jewish school i hadn't found this so in a way 
me kind of kind of doing the, this work in theater and not in a Jewish community was also paying tribute to a different network or framework which I had been raised in basically or which I, where I had become a Jew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, thank, thank you so much. I'm going to call on uh, Michael Meyer, um, who's mm -hmm. a, a historian um, at uh, Hebrew Union College and, and a member of our, uh, our board. Michael. Hi. Uh, Hi. What I'd like to do is to put this into the context of Jewish history in Germany. And once you do that, you see that from the time of Mendelssohn, integration was a Jewish ideal, perhaps most explicitly expressed through the Zentralverein Deutscher Staatsbürger Jüdischen Glaubens. Sometimes even the word assimilation was used positively by some of the Jewish groups. Now, that was, of course, in large measure due to the fear that if they didn't do that, then they wouldn't be fully emancipated, wouldn't be fully accepted in Germany. But I think what I want to stress in terms of what you're saying is you're not only taking a radical position vis-a-vis -vis German history, but also very much vis-a-vis -vis Jewish history. And mm -hmm. I thought you might want to comment on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so, Emmanuel. Thank you so much for this. Um, that is really like going straight to the point of. I, I just I'm just finishing my work on my second book, which is going to be called Gegenwartsbewältigung, um, dealing with the present. Um, and it actually like the like it actually has a chapter on this on this history of, of what you call uh, and of what I, I'd also call the. Um, idea of like that Jewish history in Germany is usually told as the history of integration or assimilation. And that goes as far as having the, um, the like more religious folks in the early 20th century saying, if this goes on for another one or two generations, Judaism basically is going to be gone. Um, you, you had that right in the 20s and then you had modern Orthodox and all that kind of, kind of things showing up. So but this, I think, I feel like, um, and I came across this thought when I was um, um, thinking about a few museums I had been working with before. Um, you do have a bit of a of a of an established dramaturgy, like a, an established um, a, a, a narrative that is telling the story of German Jewish interaction. Interaction always uh, the story of the Jews on the in the in the geography of Germany always as a story of German Jewish interaction. Um, so what you find is before in the Middle Ages the Jews didn't belong, then slowly they did start to belong. That in a certain point they did emancipate and get all the rights. Then the Nazis came, the whole thing kind of didn't work out, and then in the end everything was good, and now Jews can live in Germany as equals. That's basically the the narrative that that you find in in Jewish museums. And I'm just wondering if this narrative really is, is meeting the, let's say, crucial element that makes um, the Jewish presence in Germany also in the, in the last centuries so, so fruitful. Um, if you look at, at all those um, it's like important inputs and important inspirations that came from a Jewish artistic, intellectual, and, and so on and so on practice, um, and I'm wondering whether what would happen if we start to tell the story in a different way. If we start to tell the story as a story of, of course, Jewish assimilation, that actually, like that happens, people do convert, but also of prolonged Jewish difference. So what happens if we if we if we do not ask how German did the Jews become, but how different did the Jews stay? Um, and that I think opens up for different stories, which just let me give you two, two uh, things that I came along. The one is a Jewish Muslim connection that happened in the 20s and 30s. I think Gerdy and Jonker just wrote a book on that, which is a like Indian Muslims and Jews in Berlin, which were also um, uh, 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 homosexual uh, uh, in, in many cases. They kind of formed networks to go against the rising tide of right-wing folkish thought. And you find uh, Susanne Heschel, who just wrote a, like, wrote a book a few years back with Mathis on Seitz called Jewish um, Isla Jewish Islam, Jewish Islam, 
which is um, asking for the very specific role Jewish scholars of Islam um, played in Germany. And this is also going against the, uh, like a simple Orientalism scheme by Edward Said. So what you find is once you, once you focus on the difference of Jews and not the Germanness of Jews, you find it, you, it opens, suddenly opens up a different perspective on, on what actually drives progress and what drives um, um, the, 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 like the, the, the shift within German society, a very slow and very painful shift within so, uh, German society to a more pluralistic perspective on, on, on belonging and on who is there and who is not. Um, and to maybe just one, one thing that I found very saddening, but also very striking was a book that had just been, um, that was just rediscovered now by Ulrich Alexander Boschwitz, who was a, a, a German Jew uh, who died on a British ship that was bombed by a German submarine in 1937 or something uh, close to New Zealand. And his second book is called Der Reisende, The Traveler. Um, and it's about a, 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 like an assimilated bourgeois Jew in Germany where the Nazis start to take away everything. And um, this Jewish man is not able to go against the German state at any point because he has basically put all his faith into integration and into assimilation. So you find with Ulrich Alexander Boschwitz, basically the cliche or the, 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 the we know it wasn't only a cliche, the reality of assimilated Jews who couldn't believe that the Nazis would do that kind of stuff, but also who couldn't muster any resources to go against that because of their integratedness. So in a way, the argument for difference would also be an argument um, um, for, for a Wehrhafte Demokratie, for to be able to resist, because you're not able to resist once you identify with the state. I think you find that, especially in the Nazi period, where the right wing among the Jews, the Max Naumann people, for example, mm -hmm. had great difficulty in understanding that there could be such a complete reversal, or at least they regarded it as a complete reversal of attitudes toward the Jews, mm -hmm. and as a result, believed that Hitler would not last uh, to their own peril. Mm -hmm. Um, on that note, I just want to do a very brief plug for a, a book by Philip Nielsen, a scholar at Sarah Lawrence University about uh, Jewish involvement in right wing politics. Um, mm -hmm. We're actually planning an event with him. Um, hope it happens in, uh, in real time um, uh, rather than online, but uh, could, could end up being on Zoom too. Um, uh, thank, thanks so much for your question, Michael. Um, I have a question from Tekla Shemansky. Are you still on the call? Um, it looks like you are. I'm going to unmute you. Um, Tekla, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Do I recognize your name from the Aufbau? Yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'd, we'd love to hear your question from Alex. Um, yes, I'm going to read the, the question that I wrote you. Um, you know, some German Jews, myself included, feel reluctant to have Germans laugh at their expense. Um, do you differentiate between the act reactions of non-Jews to the fake news, et cetera, and Jews? And should Germans laugh? And how uncomfortable were they to laugh? Hmm. Thank you. Um, mm, well, I, I, I'd like to believe there's a difference between a Jewish joke and a Jew joke, like a, a Judenwitz and a Jüdischer Witz. Um, with the adjective designating a, um, let's say, self-defined way to make fun of yourself and, and um, the Judenwitz actually being the German side making fun of Jews. Um, I guess one thing we decided very early on in our work was to kind of not try to um, really change a non-Jewish German public but, but to define a space where it wouldn't matter this much. So we try to create a, let's say, Jewish black box, if you want so, where um, we'd, we'd set the rules. And, and once we had set the rules, we were able to kind of sideline a, a German perspective. And we did that also by not allowing any questions. 
and by, for example, in the radical Jewish culture days, we we announced a panel discussion, just a bit like we have now, but with more people, and we announced that we got we we answer like reply to every questions that arose during the radical Jewish culture days. But then what we did was to script the whole discussion, even the questions. And we'd made this visible. We actually had our scripts on our laps and we had the questions in our hands. And we said, look, there's a question. Does anybody want to ask this question? So we kind of tried to play this back. We kind of tried to, to, to play back that, that there's a certain expectation for a performance of a very specific position, which has been internalized by both sides and which um, we kind of try to, to get away from. So, so the answer would be um, within the space we tried to create, we felt like we had a bit more of defining power than we did in a usual context. That'd be that, but that's more, mostly a, um, that there was a hope. I don't like. I don't really know if it worked in in, in every case. Thanks, Tecla. Did did you want to respond, or uh, do you feel like your question is? Um, yeah, well, answered? yeah, it has been answered. Thank you very much. And and, and Max, uh, viele Grüße nach Berlin. Ich bin in Berlin aufgewachsen. Yeah, danke schön. Grüße zurück. <laughs> I just told him that, you know, I'm very, very happy for this talk because, you know, as growing up, I grew up in Berlin. Um, I left uh, in 1982 um, and went to Israel. And for me, when I left, you know, the the, um, the situation between Germans and German Jews were like Max said, you know, the, the victors and the victims. And, you know, they came back and, you know, they said, OK, we, we're going to excuse what you did and we're going to continue living with you and that whole you know the the, the sh shift to jews becoming the victors mm -hmm. I, I i have never never experienced that living in germany and i find it mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. so thank you for that great thank you uh thank you so much tecla um max we have a question from someone um sort of about the um about parallels in the american context mm -hmm. and uh, i know you were planning to come to america uh, we, this event was supposed to take place uh, earlier in April in, in person, and we hope that we do it um, in person mm -hmm. soon, next time you're able to travel. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but um, uh, um, it, in, ter in terms of, you know, speaking in detail about the American situation, but since mm -hmm. you did mention it um, in uh, in the top, like a, a sort of Anglo-American view of diversity mm -hmm. and, and how you how that's different. And I think, um, you you know, we'd probably get a lot of interesting views from Americans on that, um, mm -hmm. you know, what whether it's truly so different. But um, is it OK if I put this question on for you? It's from yeah, please. Evelyn, Evelyn Frankford. Um, are you still there? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to unmute you now and you can. Uh, Ask your question. Evelyn, are you there? I'm here. I'm unmuted. My question, uh, because I heard that comment in the beginning, I'm always intrigued by the question uh, that Jill Lepore has been exploring of late, historian at Harvard, of when the term American, like real American, you know, like Sarah Palin used the term real American, she means white Protestants. She mm -hmm. does not mean black people, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and uh, today there was a comment about by uh, Ibram Kendi, who is a black commentator on racism, who said, you know, all these so-called patriots who say it's their right to not stay home under the COVID regulations. Mm -hmm. If that were black people saying, it's our right to go out into the streets the police would be rounding them up and they would be in jail. So the whole question, I guess it's more of a comment, but I wouldn't mind your, your thoughts on this question. As much as America has been more of a melting pot than Germany, for example, um, my parents were refugees from Vienna. So it was a little, it was different and the same. Um, uh, but just the whole question of African-Americans not being considered real Americans. 
um, mm -hmm. which they just haven't been ever in history. Mm -hmm. Any thought? Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you so much. Um, I guess that'd be that'd be a great, like our original thought was to have Rebecca Guba from Asylum Arts over to kind of relate to have us kind of talk about the Jewish situation in New York and the Jewish situation in Germany, and then be able to relate to both sides. Um, I feel like like um, Jews in Germany after 45 have kind of been put into a very, very uncommon minority position. They remain a discriminated minority, but at the same time, they're extremely central to a reconstruction of a German self-image. So um, you have a, you have a, like the Jewish side doesn't, for example, have a problem to, to assume, uh, to be heard, to assume a talking position. But what it does have a problem is to voice diversity because that is not really part of the, of the, of the symbolic ascription of what they're about to talk, like supposed to talk about. If we're talking about the, the, the um, black, uh, African American um, um, position um, that are probably count like we could probably think about similarities um, until 1945, maybe even after this, um, because I think the 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 um, dynamics you're describing of the white people being um, treated in a different way than black people, I guess, does also work for let's say people who are now being called Muslim people and used to be called. Turkish or Arabic people, something like that. Um, you also find this for lower class and 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 middle class uh, in Germany as well. Um, I do think if we if we talk about comparing both situations, we probably also have to talk about the different histories of racism and folkish thought, which are just not the same. I feel like in in the states, there's less uh, increasingly more so, but less of a folkish essentialistic idea um, which which in Germany has had an immense career of like the the German pure blood um, um, owning the country all that kind of stuff which which really rose to to fame and uh, with the Nazis or as in the states I feel like racism has been the structuring element in in organizing society in a dominant uh, like in, in dominant groups and non-dominant groups and always kind of shifting between who has been white and who has been black. And then we could talk about how Jews in, in the States became white and in Germany they didn't uh, uh, and how that kind of kind of changes. Um, I do not feel like I can go any further without having anyone to, to talk about that directly. Uh, uh, thanks, so Max. And thank you, Evelyn, for your question. That, that reminds me of... Um, what you just said reminded me of the book um, um, Hitler's American Model by by the Yale, I think Yale <laughs> lawyer, James Whitman, which is um, about how the Nazis used um, American white supremacism mm. uh, in the 20s and 30s uh, okay. as, as a model. It's a very, very interesting um, mm -hmm. book. Uh, I think it was recently presented at the Center for Jewish History. It was something to look into. Um, I uh, we're, we're at about an hour and 15 minutes. I'd like to ask just sort of one more question and then hand it over um, to um, our executive uh, and then let you have uh, obviously the last word of the program and then hand it over to our executive director, Billy Weitzer um, to, uh, uh, to say some parting words. Um, uh, but I think it, it's, um, and the asking about the links between say, um, diversity and discrimination amongst groups in America um, gets back to an important concept in your work as it relates to Germany. And I think one that is very relevant for America. And um, that's the idea that the answer to these concepts of and discourses of integration or light culture mm. um, mm. uh, is, um, I don't know how fixed of a term you see this as, but it, it comes up often and that's radical diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wonder if you can talk about what that means um, and why you think it's important to connect this Jewish story to, uh, or this Jewish um, hmm. uh, thing, Jewish thing uh, yeah. <laughs> to, um, to the situation of migrants um, 
-hmm. and, and other minorities and and all mm -hmm. the various intersections of 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 um different uh, types of identity um i mean it, it seems like there's a real call for solidarity in your work among these groups um mm -hmm. but that you also connect them conceptually and i'm wondering if you can just comment on mm -hmm. that and and what your vision of radical diversity is because it sounds like something that um uh we could use uh actually a little bit more of uh you know in, in our own society here on the other side of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um well th yeah thank you so much for that for that question because that kind of also goes for um probably something like a almost i don't know how you call that maybe a like histor historical philosophical conclusion to draw from the 20th century or something that it's kind of kind of going to that because I feel like one answer to the question of allyship um, is just that all of those groups are being targeted at the same time. You find that with the attack in Halle last year where a guy, I mean, it's almost a model case. A guy tries yeah. to get into a synagogue. He doesn't manage and he kills a woman and a guy in a donor, which is like a, like a place where you support, like where you support, like expect to find migrants. He didn't shoot a migrant, but basically he wanted. So um, one answer would be because we are all targets, which is not a very strong argument, but at least it's an argument. Um, but then also you could say, and that's more the historical argument um, that after 45, something that you should learn from a Jewish perspective, a conclusion you should draw from the Holocaust and the failed attempt to assimilate, because you always have to think those things together. The Jews tried to behave as good as possible, and then this happened. Um, so if you think both together, um, what you find is that, or at least the conclusion I would draw is that you do not need a society that is more secure for Jews. You actually need a different society. Because as long as the society stays the same, and I'm going to get to the point of what staying the same actually means in just a second, as long as it stays the same, um, it's not going to be able to provide the security that minorities need. And by minorities, I actually mean all kinds of different minorities. But And, and then I, I boil this down to the, to the um, sentence or, or uh, uh, the proverb of... Um, and nächstes Mal werden vielleicht zuerst die Moscheen brennen, aber dann auch wieder die Synagogen. So next time, maybe the mosques are going to burn first, but then the synagogues are going to burn again or as well. So, so you do find, I think you do find this kind of um, um, connection also within the German presence um, if you're not trying to kind of close your eyes against that. And I think from a Jewish side, there is an intense desire. And I'm using this word very, very consciously and a desire to get away from this history and to say it's not going to hit us again, like this, like it's, it's impossible. It can't happen again. Um, and and I feel like this idea is kind of is kind of moving you further away from other minorities than you are. Um, so what happens is that you 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 are surprised when suddenly you are being targeted as one of the minorities. For example, with the circumcision debate, uh, uh, which you felt like wasn't actually directed at you, which may even be true. It may be true uh, that the uh, circumcision debates a, a few years back was actually targeted at Muslims and it kind of hit the Jews as collateral damage, but it did. So, so we got to think about that um, and about how should a society look that is not, and now I'm going to the third uh, point, um, that is not uh, uh, in a continuation uh, uh, of, of political concepts that were also active in the 19th century and also active in the first half of the sec uh, or in the 20th century, basically all of the time. Um, I'm talking about West Germany now mostly. Um, by the way, we haven't talked enough about the difference of GDR and, and, and uh, uh, it'll be another West, program. That'll be that'll be another one. So I'm not going into that now, but just to tell you, there's a lot of different uh, mm -hmm. stories to, to be told about that as well. But I guess what we find in and like in all like in continuation is uh, the idea that a a society, no matter how its how its system works, if it's a monarchy or a, a dictatorship or a democracy, um, always has has to be organized around the dominant center. Um, 
this is the one thing that you need a dominant group that defines who's belonging and who's not. And that is kind of holding things together. This is the one idea. And then every minority has to move in. This is what you call integration or assimilation. But also within German political tradition, what you find is a very, very strong desire for harmony. The idea that society in its ultimate goal has to arrive at a point of harmony. So for, a, for this kind of tradition, it's impossible to imagine society as a place of continuous uh, uh, strife or continuous struggle. And I'd say that um, if we actually want, like that those concepts, which are, just, which are just outlined, are actually working against democracy. Because the way democracy works is that it's, it's, it's a constant strife, like people like uh, Georg Simmel talked about that as well. It's like, there's no way um, um, you're gonna arrive at a point where harmony happens. Uh, I, get, I, I think Friedrich Nietzsche said at one point, uh, the harmony, that the bourgeois is looking for is the, the, the silence of the graveyard. So that is, I think, very, very, like, like very, very much to the point of, of the, what harmony actually means. It means silence. Um, and that the idea of a dominant group is actually not how society works anymore. So what, what I'm trying to do with the integration and, and radical diversity, and I'm using this term taken it from a program we run at Free Uni F FH Potsdam, like a Fachhochschule, I don't know, like a kind of, what, what uh, is college. that? A college. A college, yeah. a college in Potsdam. Technical we run this college. program called uh, 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 Social Justice and Radical Diversity, where we try to, to develop no, new concepts for a society that is, that is not being structured in this dominant way, but trying to, to have a, a, an equal idea of how uh, discrimination works and how diversity could actually be recognized in a non-discriminatory way um and we're we're actually trying to 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 develop a concept that um is not anymore focused around a center of society so if you if you take integration you have the center and then everybody has to move in but to say all those different places where the different people are positioned already constitute what society is being made of and how society is being made strong. So actually what, what the argument I would like to make is that it takes away um, the, the, the de defensive uh, uh, quality of society, which is diverse and which is based on diversity if you, if you insist on this idea of everybody moving to the center. Because actually what you do is you, uh, you're excluding a quarter of society at least which has a migrant background by now. And you're also excluding people who are queer, people who are disabled, people who are like all those kind of categories, which are kind of pushing people out. So in a way, I think what we have to start thinking about is a society that is not built around the center, but that basically starts to, to, have, to be a fabric, um, more like the old uh, Flickenteppich, which was once dismissed in Germany as a horror scenario, but I'd say that is actually much closer to the idea of radical diversity in German society today than the idea of a center, which, which hasn't really ever worked and was very, very disastrous for, for in its exaggeration for German history. Well, th thank you so much for that answer. Um, and I think everyone can tell that we've just barely scratched the surface of, of things that, um, that you could talk about. Um, and uh, so I hope we do more of these events, but um, I'd like to, um, I'd like to call on Billy Weitzer, the uh, executive director of the Leo Beck Institute, just to. Um, thanks, thanks, Billy. Um, yes, I'm here, and I want to thank David and uh, the staff of LBI for supporting this, and especially thank Max, who um, it's, it's we're so sorry you couldn't be in New York with us. I remember your visit when we first met uh, mm. two or three years ago, and um, uh, your your what you're talking about has grown but also remained very consistent and i really saw or heard three parts the first is is taking the the, the totally unique history of germany and and diving deep and um and then and and how german jews fit or don't fit into that and then turning it on its ear you know totally and it, it's just amazing what it teaches us uh, we then wandered into what will be as david said to be the next 
panel that we'll have. And as you mentioned, to have an interlocutor where we can do some compare and contrast with the US and with minorities elsewhere. I, I just, I, there's, there's such potential there. And I, I don't blame you for only going as far as you went because you, you, you do need people who have, are enmeshed in those societies to understand. And of course, the differences are as informative as the similarities and there's just so much there. But then I loved where you went right at the end, which is what does this tell us about what, what our aspirations are for society? And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I so much look forward to continuing that conversation so um, next year in New York, right? Yes, Fashion Abbe in New York. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, but just just brilliant. And um, if if people, uh, we'll make sure that people can continue to we, this discussion, or especially maybe David could follow up, or you could send any uh, writings, both in English and in German, that people might want to read mm -hmm. uh, of of your work. And uh, because there's a lot more to be done, but this this was just fantastic and. I thank you and I thank everybody for hanging in. Uh, people seem to be becoming um, Zoom worthy now. And so uh, we, we <laughs> seem to have worked pretty well. So um, good night in Germany and good evening uh, in America. And um, thank you. And I see Frank clapping and yes, let's all clap for. All right, yeah, thank you, Max. Um, yeah, thanks everyone to, for tuning in. Max, uh, gute Nacht and um, bis, nächst, bis zum nächsten Mal. Thank you yes. very much. We really appreciate it. It was uh, Thank very, you, David. very inspiring. All right. Goodbye, Great. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.